Awesome. Okay. So this as the CI working group, it's uh, currently scheduled to be monthly. <clears throat> on the third Tuesday, I believe is what we're on. And this meeting is being recorded. Just to let everyone know it's going to be published on YouTube. This is the, oh, I'm going to move that. Same Zoom that we use every time, CNCSCI Working Group. And these notes uh, that I was sharing earlier <clears throat> are reused. I believe that everyone should see those in the, the slides as well as the notes in the chat. If you don't have them, then post a message there. So I am going to give an update on the CrossCloud CI project real quick, and then we can jump into some of the other ones. I think we have a few topics um, here that we're going to go over. The upcoming events that are related for CI within Kubernetes and um, CNCF, FDI Mini, Mini Summit, there's a CNCF CNF project where there's a lot of demos happening there. There's Kubernetes um, network service mesh talk at FDI Mini Summit, so there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, at KubeCon, there's going to be presentations on both of those topics. There's also on the CrossCloud CI an intro talk. And then there's a deep dive talk where there's an over overlap between the CrossCloud CI project and the CNF project where there's been some CI testing for doing um, work on that CNF project. And then Andrew from VMware is giving a talk on adding support um, to CrossCloud and, and how he's been using the different components in that project. I don't know if we have anyone to give an update on the KubeCon Shanghai for some of these topics on the call. Um, let's see. I don't think we have anyone that was there. But there was a, a talk about API Snoop and digging in that people may find interesting. And that's right here. So um, there was, we gave an intro at KubeCon China and Watson was there and dug into that. The plan was to dig into the project side of testing and we've deferred that to deal with some planning that we want for the project. So that focus was the intro and then trying to get feedback. Uh, we've added Oracle support and there's some updates for some features on the dashboard itself for showing NA badges if, if builds fail and some other things on the dashboard itself. What we're looking at right now is what is the next iteration that we want for that whole project and specifically for the dashboard. Um, if I, I could bring that up. The dashboard itself, there's a split between testing of Kubernetes across the cloud, cloud providers and the different feature set, and then testing projects on those um, clusters. And they're kind of two different purposes and audiences. So one thing that we're looking at is post KubeCon Seattle is doing planning for the next iteration and updating documentation for projects to contribute themselves. What do we, what do we want um, to do with the different pieces? So we've been doing a lot of collaboration with different projects, um, the VMware side. So I would love to get feedback from the community on what they would like to see. Um, there's some ideas that we've been having with different projects like um, the Core DNS and Prometheus that have use cases that they would like to have in their testing. So that's something that um, we've been interested in 
Watson's talked about reference, um, reference test cases that other people can look at where the projects are working together. And we'd like to get feedback um, for the next version of, of the dashboard and what's going to be shown, what would be useful, as well as the components underneath, like cross cloud and, and cross project and the different pieces that do different testing. Um, probably want to defer a big Q&A, but if, if people would like to do in this call, but if people would like to provide some feedback now um, during the call, we could do that or we could defer it till later. And then obviously we'd be happy for feedback and tickets and other things. Okay, so I'll take that as something we can defer for right now. So um, these are some of the presentations and stuff that were referred to that we're attending, including um, ongoing meetings. I'm gonna skip over the overview, but feel free to look through these on how it currently works. And related topics. So go over this. <clears throat> um, this would be kind of related to some of that feedback. So part of the as part of the effort on the CNCF project for CNFs, we are trying to make it easier to do um, testing with network functions on um, Kubernetes and containers, as well as I would say, how can you re recreate the test and environments on hardware? So bare metal type stuff. A lot of the focus has been on packet. We've also started working towards supporting um, other environments. So FDIO, which is a project at Linux Foundation, has a, a lab and we've had access to those. So we've been trying to do testing there and be able to reuse the same code with modifications to work in both platforms and then taking those a lot of this is docker and kvm and then focus on what we're doing for kubecon so the tie-in back to i guess the cross cloud project would be how we're deploying kubernetes so that's trying to use a lot of the same pieces for the cross cloud uh, let me go back over here. So using the um, cross cloud project, we actually are able to deploy the cluster and there's been a lot of updates to support specific hardware, reserved things, reserved hardware on, on packet. And then once those, uh, you get past the, the base cluster that's, it's been able to deploy to the different clouds. Uh, we added support for tying into Ansible so that we can start adding all the good stuff that people have. There's roles and stuff for doing various things out there. And tying all this together to extend what we could do in cross cloud. So you could continue using it and all of that. So the different stages are usable. So trying to make, um, add more documentation for folks to start seeing what's going on outside of what we're doing and ideally be able to use the different components individually as well as as a whole. So if you want to bring up an entire cluster, a uh, Kubernetes cluster that has layer two support in it and deploys network functions in certain scenarios, we'll we have some reference code that we're working on that we're going to be demoing at the FDIO Mini Summit as well as KubeCon um, for doing that. And then the different pieces are broken down. So if you wanted to dig into individual parts itself, um, everything's open source. Um, the test um, 
the harness that we're using is NFV bench and um, T-Rex for generating packets. So that's probably it there. These will some upcoming presentations um, at KubeCon and around there. Any questions? I know there's kind of a lot of topics before I move on. Okay. I think we have some other talks, but they're not in the slides. So let me go back to the notes himself. So I believe um, Andrew is not here to, I'm sorry, I think I skipped past. Andrew is not here to talk about his. So Melvin, are you available and ready uh, for your topic? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I will stop sharing if you want to share your screen. Okay, cool. Let's see here. All right. All right. Should be able to see my screen, hopefully. Looks good. All right, cool. Okay, so um, basically going to talk about Open Lab, which as shown in the notes, um, basically I say it's curated infrastructures are for open source testing. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I uh, go by Mr. Hillsman pretty much everywhere. Um, I, I think learning is very important. Uh, you know, lifelong learner myself personally, uh, self learning in a lot of areas, and I like sports. Um, I like watching them more so than actually participating because I'm, I'm old, much older now. <laughs> um, I work for Huawei as an open source community manager. I'm also a user committee chair for the OpenStack Foundation. And uh, of course, uh, I work with OpenLab as a governance member, which is what we're talking about today. And just kind of a little bit of background of why we started OpenLab or kind of the idea, some ideas and philosophy as it relates to um, how we perceive cloud and, and things of that nature. Um, so there's this great article by 451 Research that was done over 2017. And it talks basically about people, you know, that the public cloud is not necessarily forever. And there's this idea that's been floating around since last year, uh, a little bit before last year of what we call cloud repatriation, which basically suggests that, you know, people are moving away from public cloud. There's been a lot of talk about folks moving away from public cloud for a number of different reasons. Um, but these folks, you know, went ahead and dug into it. And you can see on the right hand side of this chart, these were the reasons for uh, people shifting their workload from public cloud. But it wasn't a, uh, it's not a, the idea of repatriation, right, is like, it wasn't working. It's total failure on the other person, the other you know entity's part. Uh, it's a permanent you know shift, and that's not the case uh, in IT infrastructure. So the the public discussion does not really reflect what it, what actually happens on the ground in IT departments, right? So they move away from public cloud not because public cloud is not necessarily not working. It's just that there's other reasons, you know, like performance and availability issues you know, uh, improves uh, on-premises cloud. So maybe they didn't have a cloud and then they, a uh, private cloud and then they stood up one or, you know, again, a number of the other things that are on the right-hand side there. Um, and then they, they asked, you know, okay, if you're moving, you know, for folks that, so that was really focused on like people moving away from public cloud. Um, and then, you know, once they had those discussions, it's like, okay, you know, we're not moving away from public cloud necessarily permanently or all of our stuff is, you know, no longer in, open, in public cloud. So the question is, you know, turn to hybrid cloud, right? And the idea is that people have a number of different reasons for using one or the other or both. Um, and so looking through that lens, right, the open source cloud ecosystem is very large. 
um, as many public cloud service providers across you know the whole world you know, basically uh, there's hundreds of you know open source projects there's all types of clouds um, open source and proprietary software working together and then there's users you know up and down the spectrum all across and, and across the spectrum um, and not only do you have you know what in my view the previous slide is showing more traditional landscape or view you know, of open source and you know, open source cloud ecosystem but then you also have you know the cloud native components as well and more sh more shift towards you know cloud native uh, philosophy and ideology right so with open lab the focus is like moving towards enabling testing reporting and development of this stuff across multiple clouds and not focusing necessarily on single projects but really the integration of these projects because people want solutions they don't want necessarily just one project um, or one project generally does not stand alone in a person's um, use of that project they're normally using it with a number of other tools together and so um, some of the motivations of open lab is or people participating for that matter is like you have explicit customer requests like they need support for product x from vendor y and you don't want to be the only person um, dealing with the pain and the anguish per se of trying to deliver that because sometimes those customer requests are um, across different companies um, or across different business units within the same company and so you want to be able to have some idea of what is and is not working um, there's also technical requirements like the need for a feature or function. You don't want to necessarily be the company carrying that patch, you know, for a particular project uh, for infinity, right? Just for a particular, just because you have a particular customer, um, someone else more than likely has that same customer or that same feature or function request. And so it's best again in the spirit of open source to work together on that. Um, and a number of other things. So what we did was we focused primarily on OpenStack um, when we initially, you know, again, got started last year. And these were some of the motivations we were able to pull out in terms of pain points across, you know, five different, you know, aspects of things that I showed earlier in terms of the open source ecosystem. And what we were looking at in terms of open lab to address those pain points is, you know, like helping to show up the SDK, um, tools for OpenStack. Um, so update them, you know, for a variety of different languages. There's a lot of, there's a lot of variation between the different um, SDKs or language, the, the language bindings for uh, OpenStack. Um, pro, uh, broker for, so we're kind of like a broker for providers, right? Um, they allow people to collaborate and, and contribute. But the OpenStack found, you know, OpenStack only stopped at the native APIs. We didn't focus on the ecosystem right above it, which was the language bindings and the SDKs. So that also brought about difficulty testing across, you know, OpenStack-based clouds uh, for a number of different reasons. Difficulty in release planning and maintenance across those implementations, and then also um, we were able to, you know, focus on helping where gain awareness and acceptance. Um, in this you know vast OpenStack ecosystem, and so uh, again, being able to work with the OpenStack Foundation and the the, the larger open cloud uh, open source ecosystem is where Open Lab really kind of sits uh, and, and finds its value. So these are the five you know of course OpenStack Foundation, uh, and then these initial partners were the ones who were saying, okay, we like the idea, we think it's valid. Um, you made a case and let's kind of work on it. But of course, it's not just about those companies, but we also had people um, from different communities on board. Um, so what we focused on primarily initially was Gopher Cloud, Terraform, Kubernetes, and OpenStack. Um, so again, the two biggest you know, open source projects that we could think about and that were really in you know, need of support were Kubernetes uh, and OpenStack working together not necessarily the projects individually because again, we focus on integration. So Open Lab essentially has a governance model. It's very loosely structured. Uh, it will evolve over time, of course. Um, and here's just an, again, an idea of, you know, where we were able to marry together um, software components that are open source 
public, private, and hybrid clouds are kind of like the proprietary, you know, in the, you know, aspect of things. And then also we brought in academia for lab and project support. And what we were able to have initially up front was, uh, so we have a CI environment, um, and this is our initial capacity as of today. We started off with two, um, and then that year we grew to uh, add four more providers for the CI system, which basically they provide virtual machines across uh, six clouds. Uh, and then also we have dedicated infrastructure that has been made available to us. Initially, we did not have any dedicated infrastructure, but now we have six uh, providers um, giving us uh, dedicated infrastructure. And as you can see, there's a lot of dedicated service here, uh, quite a few uh, IoT devices. Uh, and then there's um, the WSN is, I forget what it stands for, basically it's network related, it's wide uh, spectrum networking, I believe is what it is. Um, also, again, just, just kind of giving a, an idea of what we've been able to accomplish. Um, we've got additional projects, we've, we've added more projects. Remember I said we only had Gopher Cloud, um, Terraform, um, Kubernetes, and OpenStack initially. I don't have all the projects listed here, but here's just a few of them. We've got more companies participating, more people participating, and again, more partnerships. So um, I've already kind of went over what's available, but remember we only had you know four logos essentially before, five logos, and here's uh, some of the additional ones we've added. Everyone is not on here. And um, I'll kind of skip these two because basically this is just saying, you know, here's what we are delivering. Um, so like repeatable deployments, uh, we have a roadmap. Um, we're able to help facilitate roadmap for OpenStack SDKs, um, integration experience and best practices around, you know, like us standing up OpenStack environments and testing these things out. So showing folks, you know, Here's some ways in which we do high availability, or here's like reference architecture for that, um, helping focus on zero downtime and skip level upgrades and things of that nature. So making, making resources available for people to not only um, see these things working, but also try them out on their own so that they're not uh, destroying uh, production environments. And also helping folks to shift their culture to a more DevOps-centric culture by, if they can test stuff out in the lab first, then it helps to um, allow them to sync, you know, for example, if they need a test environment to work with their open, to work with their production environment, or they do like canary, uh, canary um, deployments or rolling, you know, rolling out, you know, features of that, you know, uh, new features and stuff like that. They were able to kind of test things out in the lab before doing it in production. Um, and again, it's just ways to get involved. Um, you know, essentially you could, you could get involved in issues just by sharing, you know, things that you would like that you think that should be integrated tested together um, you can leverage you know the SDKs the tests that we're doing like all the stuff that we're doing you can also leverage those things so you can only share so give input but you can also take what's already available uh, and try things out and you know give a creative feedback loop for us uh, you can still contribute infrastructure um, but we have quite a bit of it, as you've already seen uh, and so primarily you know we're looking for more people to uh, contribute um, these tests, you know, test cases, um, uh, integration requests, and also participate in helping to uh, fulfill some of those, uh, the work that's related to, to making some of those things happen. So what I did was I created a little video here. The audio won't play, so I'll try to, um, I'll try to uh, narrate as best possible. But basically, it's a video of me logging into one of the test beds um, and showing you how through what's called profiles, you would save, you know, you could, you, you could save whatever you've done in a profile and then you or others could come along behind you and uh, create what's called experiments, which, pro, which are based on profiles. And so it allows, again, that repeatable testing where you, don't, you do it one time and then people can come behind you and they can augment it, they can make it better, you know, or, or you can make it better for yourself and you don't have to continue to do it. So I'm just gonna let the video play, like I said, just near right here. So I'm logging in right now. You can see that there's two experiments that I have running. I'm going to show you profiles, which uh, we've saved. And so instantiating them is just simply just clicking the play button there, but I'm showing you a topology of one of the experiments. 
so when you ex create experiment by default in this particular test bed, OpenStack is the default. Um, but you click the change profile button to choose another. And so like we have one for Kubernetes, we have some that are like, you just see two nodes connected together. Uh, this one's got a bunch of nodes connected, multiple layer two links, multiple sites um, that you see with that profile. Could be just, you know, small little nodes, you know, it doesn't have to be as large as the other one. So you just use the create topology button here. You can drag and drop machines. So these are those dedicated servers, you know, those thousands of dedicated servers or programmable network switches. Create multiple sites. You can just drag them from one site to the other. So you want to test things, you know, I have this site in, you know, the US, I have another site in Canada or someplace else you can emulate that. Um, or you could actually um, spin up nodes that are in those two different sites. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're emulating. It could actually be what is happening in the physical world. So I'm just showing again how easy it is to move these uh, virtual machines as well as dedicated servers together, how to link them together by simply dragging the line there. You can connect um, the devices themselves or connect them directly to the link by dragging over to the link there. So that's a layer two link between those devices. And then if things get a little messy, you can click the tidy view button there uh, to clean them up. So when you click on a node, um, you can modify, of course, its name. You can modify the operating system, the hardware type, if it needs a IP address or not. Um, in these images, you can create your own or you can use ones that others have created. Um, that's basically what I'm showing there. And then you can also add like a tarball, like an archive. If you want to drop an archive, you know, on the node after you create it and then execute a command, you can do that as well. And that's just focusing on provisioning the um, devices when you, once you stand them up. And again, there's a number of other things you can do after the fact, right? Um, you can use Ansible if you wanted to from your local machine, or you could, you know, have uh, Ansible on uh, in that archive or part of that command as well, right? So if you have any questions, um, here's basically how to get in contact with us and the website's there and that's pretty much it. So um, in terms of this, why I thought it'd be beneficial to present uh, Open Lab to the CNCF CI working group is um, I think we have um, very compatible missions and we've already been working with, for example, Ed. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen right now, if that's all right. Um, we've been working with Ed from Packet. Um, as you saw, uh, hopefully you saw in the presentation, Ed is, uh, Packet is one of our sponsors. Um, and, you know, we're looking forward to doing more with Ed uh, and, and along with like offering resources for the CNCF cluster. Uh, but for the CNCF CI working group, um, I think we could, you know, again, offer physical resources to augment some of what's already available, as well as, um, you know, some tests that the, C the, the working group wants to do as it relates to like reference architectures, things of that nature, making it repeatable um, in terms of the infrastructure itself, like getting the physical devices together and, and uh, mapped out a certain way. Um, you know, it's just kind of, I think it's a good, I think it could be a good partnership and I would like to explore um, how we can be a benefit to the CNCFCI working group going forward. And that's it for me. Awesome, thanks Melvin. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Melvin? I'm interested in the um, that topology editor itself. Do you know if it can be used standalone or export those visualizations outside of the software? Yes, the, the entire suite, there's a whole, um, there's actually a whole suite for managing um, 
hardware devices in, ter in terms of like configuring them and you know putting them back into pools and user uh, access and management and all that. And that particular component I'll have to, I think it's using Jax, I think it's called, but it's, it's an open source component um, that they're using. Uh, every, all of it's open source and I can get it to you and we can try to figure out how to, you know, make it work in a way that, uh, you know, that you'd like it to. And what's cool about it also is that the uh, the software, if you, for example, like if you like, there's one, um, there's one person who, like, they only had a, I think they had like a hundred gig network switch, and so like, there's no hundred gig network switch in the in the whole, you know, feder. So a lot of these resources are federated. Those, you know, thousands of nodes they're federated across multiple sites, and so you can take the actual software that I show. Um, you know, again, that the topology editor is just a component of, and if you if you only had a network switch or one other device that wasn't available in the test bed, for example, like a particular FPGA card or a particular GPU, you could actually um, stand up that software in your la in your lab or your you know facility, and you would you would become a part of the federation. So you may offer you know that GPU to folks who don't have access to a GP or, or a hundred gig switch or whatever the thing is you're offering. And, but you would also have access to all the other devices uh, as a, as a, you know, benefit of you offering your one device to the, to the uh, Federation. So it's actually a pretty cool situation. Are you able to stand up uh, different federations? So, so it sounds like what you're talking about is similar to IRC networks that federate. So can you stand up the equivalent of multiple IRC networks that have different groups that are federated, but not federated across, say, another network or another? Yeah, group? yeah. You can actually like uh, you can set it up to where um, if you so like let's say there's ten, right now like let's say the federation is, consists of ten right now, right? And you said okay, I want two. But then I want two different federations. I want to be a part of the 10, but then I want to be a part of this other smaller one I have. So you can do some overlap where you, you know, um, basically make one federation blind to the other per se. And you can actually turn that off and on. So if the so example they gave was maybe a company um, needs, you know, they're offering 10 nodes and they need five of them. Um, well, they need all 10 of them, you know, because like, let's say, for example, there's a big holiday push or something and there's a lot of, you know, usage going on. And then after that couple months, you know, five, they're only using about five of those nodes. Well, you could actually turn off the federation per se for that few months and then turn it back on for just those five nodes or all 10. So there's a lot of flexibility there too. Great. I'd, I'd love to talk with you more, um, especially looking at how they, how you're handling stuff at Packet, connecting the nodes and dealing with the API and other things like that, <clears throat> as well as non-Packet hardware. Definitely. Thanks, Melvin. You're welcome. Okay. So... Looks like you're up, Fred. Hello. So uh, let me go and just let me go and start by uh, discussing like uh, why we ended up using uh, Cube Admin. So before like we were your, sorry, would you like to share your screen, Fred? Uh, yes, I I would. Thanks. Okay, let me do that. There you go. Okay, and. There we go, you should be able to see my full screen. Looks good. Okay, so so before we get started, so uh, so I'm uh, one of the, I guess you say, co-creators, co-contributors of uh, Network Service Mesh. And so I won't go too much into, I won't go into the project itself as to what we're trying to do. Um, but uh, one of the problems that we were running into is that we needed a Kubernetes uh, cluster in the 
uh, in our CI system. So we use Circle CI, and uh, we actually have a build pipeline. I'll see if I can show you an example of what of one such uh, build pipeline. Uh, so this one looks like it passed. And so we're going to show the checks, and we'll just go to one of them, and we'll go to the workflow. So we have this basically building multiple images and so on. Uh, we have this packet deploy and a set of integration tests that run after that, and then we destroy the cluster. So a pretty pretty simple uh, setup. So um, before, and it, this this could be something maybe for your V2 planning when, when you're moving forward. One of the problems that we ran into is we were originally using the cross-cloud CI stuff that you all built, and I think it's absolutely fantastic uh, with the stuff that you've built out so far. One of the problems that we ran into, though, is that when the cluster would come up, uh, these integration tests that take about a, a minute and, and a half to, to run were taking 15 to 20 minutes to run with the cluster that was spun up through the, through the cross-cloud CI. And so for the short term, instead of trying to fully debug the system because of time constraints, uh, we decided to deploy using uh, Cube Admin. So the way that the Cube Admin part looks, uh, let me go ahead and open up the, uh, start from the beginning uh, as to what we do. So we have our make files uh, and we actually include uh, various like Kubernetes make targets and so on. And uh, eventually it, we had drew a set of includes. We include, this is uh, the stuff that we run for our packet. So if you see, we have a packet start. So you can do make packet start, and then it runs Terraform apply, and then it runs a script that installs Kubernetes. So the Terraform apply should be pretty straightforward. Uh, you already use Terraform if, if I recall properly. And so, for the create Kubernetes cluster, uh, I'll go over that pretty, uh, I'll go over that little component. And so the way that that looks is, so, so we start off with basically a, a set of uh, copying over some scripts over. So we, inst so we copy over to each of the systems, the Kubernetes uh, install script. The Kubernetes install script uh, is just this is just to install cube admin. So this is lifted straight from the uh, cube from the cube admin install page. So pretty pretty generic. Uh, installs cube admin, cube control, and uh, Docker. So after we do that, then we run two scripts in parallel. One of them is a start master, and the other one is we don't want to wait for our worker images to download. So we also run the download the worker images uh, on systems that are not the master. So the way that that, the way that, that looks is, so we have start master, and uh, which runs a cube admin init. You pass in a, a pod network seeder range, and uh, we print out, we, we go and uh, copy the config over to the home directory. Uh, since this is all, this actually is running on packet itself. We then kube control apply a, um, a CNI plugin so we can have some networking, uh, untaint our nodes, and we then do kube admin token create and print join command. And so what this print join commands does is it'll, is it'll create a script that, that does kube admin join with the proper tokens and, and email, or I'm no, sorry, the proper tokens and, and addresses necessary in order to join the master. And we store that to the join cluster, to a join cluster script. The workers just, if they're not the master, all they do is they just pull images. And that takes about a minute, minute and a half to two pull images. Uh, and then after that, we then copy the join cluster, the script that was generated, and we run it on there. We have a full working cluster. So it's a pretty, a pretty simple script. Uh, and then the only thing that's left to do in our Circle CI system is to download the, uh, is to download the uh, cube config file so we can make use of it in our in our CI path. So we found this to be. Quite, uh, quite reliable for setting up a, a cluster. And to give you a quick example of what it looks like, 
uh, when we run make packet start. So we we decided to use the Ubuntu 1604 images because on packet they're the only ones that have the fast boot. So the other ones take around I think around four three or four minutes to start. This this is set to start in uh, should be under uh, should be under a minute or around a minute on average. So it shaves off some time on our on our builds. And you'll see the uh, the script after about uh, after a few moments you'll see it start to kick it off. And you'll you'll have you'll see a full running uh, a full running system. So uh, I don't know if you want to wait around for the full working system or not. It takes around two or three minutes. Uh, and and that and that basically gets us to a point where we can then start running our our integration uh, scripts that uh, we deploy using Kube Control. So so very overall very uh, uh, overall very simple. Does does all that make sense? It does, and it looks like you're past the initial provisioning and the bootstrapping. Um, you, you can continue if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. So, so the initial. So since those are uh, are done, we'll go and grab the master, uh, and we'll just. So we have to wait for it to finish provisioning first. Uh, it should be relatively fast, but yeah, once, yeah, and once it's done, you'll have like a full, a full working. This, this one is just two, two notes. Um, I should have ran it before. Sorry about that. Do you mind if I ask a question while this is going? Sure. Uh, have you added support or are you thinking about adding support for using machines that are already up? So then you're either bootstrapping an existing machine or just running the new test, clearing out the NSM binaries and running those. Yeah, so that's a, that's a question that that that's popped up and that we've that we've been discussing was, uh, so the the idea that we came up with uh, as maybe a next further step, but we need to do some investigation on it first. Uh, well, actually, there's two steps for a network service mesh. So, uh, the the idea would be to create a namespace for each uh, for each NSM uh, for each NSM integration test. And the second thing that we'd want to do is, uh, is we have to make an assembly. Like right now, the, the CRDs that are installed uh, are not namespaced. They're, they're cluster scoped. So we need to change that so that the, so that the CRDs are, are namespace scoped instead. And so once we do that, then we can just create, have an online cluster that just continuously runs, create the, uh, create the namespace, run all the tests, Delete the namespace and everything should dis should de be deleted with it. So that's that is something we we thought of, but that's uh, that's a potential potential future step. What about um, Kubernetes versions? Are you focused on releases only right now? Are you also supporting um, master or head? Right now, it's only uh, it's only using the the latest stable. Cool. And those should become ready in a few moments. Yeah, they're there. And uh, I should have ran that with time, but it, it takes roughly three and a half minutes or so to fully provision with packet uh, new systems and uh, spin up the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the scripts themselves are not designed, like there's no reason why you couldn't run the, uh, the create Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the one area though is right now we do pull information from Terraform. So, but there's no reason why this couldn't be adapted 
to perhaps provide a list of masters and a list of workers, and then you could just loop over them and uh, run the right commands. So it should be relatively easy to, to adapt to it. Um, the one area where I think cross-cloud CI, based on our previous conversations that you may have if you wanted to adapt something like this, is that I suspect that you probably want to run off of the latest bleeding edge uh, Kubernetes uh, system. And there's two challenges that uh, I could see Cube Admin having. So number one is uh, the where you download the Kubernetes uh, images from uh, appears to be hard coded. So there's a GCR Kubernetes Kate slash uh, GCR dot IO uh, path. And so it, it doesn't look like you could build your own, publish to your own repo and then pull off of those. Uh, and a second issue that you may end up running into is there is a cube admin. They, they do, they are starting to put in some, some support for other, uh, I guess you would say configurations. So I'll show you an example. So you have cube, so cube init, you can pass in a Kubernetes version, uh, but that's only going to download from, from that, uh, that GCR, uh, GCR endpoint. And you can see the, let's see. Let's see, I, missed, I misspelled it. Yeah, you can see the, uh, the paths that it's pulling from on here. And so being able to, I, I don't know if the latest uh, versions that from the Kubernetes CI are published to this. Uh, if they are, you might be able to just pull those. Uh, but if you want to compile a specific, latest specific version on master, then uh, this this may end up having some issues with that. Um, so the so the, those are the only the only real uh, problems that the the only real problems I can see. Uh, there's I was mentioning there are there there is a, the ability to to start manipulating some of the phases, so you can start adding or changing things about the um, about the cluster that's in that's currently in alpha. So my guess is it probably doesn't have all the knobs that you want. And so uh, one option would be to, one thing that you may end up having to do if you go with the cube admin path would be to work out what knobs you want to expose. And then you may end up having to contribute to the cube admin project in order to, in order to get those knobs in. So. Uh, and I, I don't know what the process would look like for that or how long it would take or anything like that, but uh, it's another, another path. Awesome. Yeah, I've uh, just posted a related thing. Um, we've been on attending the cluster life cycle, Kubernetes cluster life cycle and some of the other uh, groups where they, it's related to KubeADM and, and how the clusters are brought up as, as far as in a, Kubernetes way, and there is needs for supporting different sources for those binaries. Um, besides the binaries, which would be a related thing, would be on the CrossCloud CI project and the dashboard itself, um, we were supporting source builds. So then you could turn on very specific flags that may not be in um, any any type of regular build, and that would allow plugins and everything else to go in. Um, I think there's that's in line with stuff that's desired for KubeADM and and the uh, cluster lifecycle in general. It's just maybe lower priority. Um, as far as the support though for cross cloud, the ability to add in or use KubeADM for part of it. I think is compatible and specifically the features that are needed um, for NSM doing these fast loops for the testing would be being able to use binaries. I think that's, that's been on our agenda for quite a while. So um, that's definitely something we'll keep in mind for like the next version reusing either built artifacts so that you don't have that build. That's probably part of the biggest delay that you're saying is that the weight on a build of a source, even the release versions. And if we don't need that, or we already have a cached version, then we can reuse those. Oh, 
the the slowdown was uh, was actually that. I mean, yes, we we did save a little bit of time off from the from the initial deployment, but the 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 main slowdown that we were running into was not actually in the deployment of Kubernetes, but when Kubernetes deploys the pods. So when we run a pod, it might take four or five minutes for the pod to run, while in uh, in the vanilla cube admin version, it was deploying in in a matter of uh, seconds. So, uh, so it seems that there's a configuration issue in the circ in the in the uh, cross cloud CI with how the Kubernetes cluster is set up. And I was able to reproduce this on uh, the on the Google cluster as well. Uh, and so, so it doesn't seem to be a. At first, I thought maybe it's an issue with Packet, but uh, it. it yeah, but it had the had the same issue on on Google, so yeah, and, and we our our hope is that um, that we can move back to uh, to cluster CI or or help cluster CI get to a point where we can then start uh, sorry yeah get the cross cloud config rather so if we can get the cross cross cloud CI back to, like to a to a point where we can just rely on that like for me that'd be the best uh, the best scenario. Because like we don't we don't want to be maintaining scripts over time uh, that are specific to to network service mesh, and would love to uh, would love to use the cross cloud CI stuff instead. Cool. Well, I'm interested in the forks because you got new ideas that come up. So those are there's definitely some stuff in here that are interesting um, for me and probably other folks. Um, I think that um, it probably we need to create a new issue on the cross cloud project and try to figure out the differences in that pod uh, performance that you're saying with kubeadm. It's pretty strange to me. There's definitely something um, weird going on. We consider the cross cloud to be vanilla. We're not, we're trying to, Lay it, bootstrap it on to the systems as um, straightforward as possible following like if you followed the docs without kubeadm and, and did a build on a given OS like CoreOS or Ubuntu then it, it should be vanilla Kubernetes but we'll get an issue up and to look into that and I'm happy for the feedback in general. Okay. Yeah, and um, we'll have to do rummage a little bit through the um, uh, through the Git history to get the exact state uh, back in terms of deploying the uh, the packet. Uh, did, did, oh, sorry for deploying the cross cloud uh, onto onto packet. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was reproducible. So so we should be able to to work that out. And my my. Uh, operational skills with trying to debug why a pod is slow uh, is not particularly strong. So any any help with that? Um, you know, I, I can see about reproducing a, a system, and then perhaps we can work together to try to work out like why why is this thing running slow? Yeah, absolutely. It looks like most of what's needed for reproducing would be based on the current working kubeadm, and then we'd create a a similar case on for cross cloud. Appreciate your help, Fred. Sure, my pleasure. And um, okay, so what are our next steps then? Do you did you is there anything you want me to to do in in terms of uh, like do, do you want me to get involved with uh, with any of your cube admin work that you're considering or um so probably have I guess we can post something on, we'll post something on the cloud native um, Slack and the CNCFCI channel to get feedback on that. Um, and to start like, here's where we can gain feedback for the planning and what we may want to do with kubeadm. If, if you can create an issue on the cross cloud project, I'll drop a, a link in here for, for that for the performance issue would be great. Okay. 
Yeah, and I, I apologize for forking in this scenario and working on this stuff and rather than working through cross cloud. Uh, it was just uh, for us uh, it was a time commitment, like a time crunch. So Yeah, no apology necessary. I, I mean I think um you know, time is understandable and like I said, I think you'll come up with different ideas and that can be contributed to, to different projects. And I'm happy for stuff like the the open lab stuff that Melvin is doing. It's we need we need different things going on so those ideas can be shared. Okay, cool. I dropped a, a link to the issues for the specifically for the provisioner in the chat. Um, it's in the Zoom chat. I can drop them into Slack as well. Um, yeah, I think Slack would be um, useful since I think Zoom goes away. Yeah. I dropped it in the CNC FCI. Yep, you got it there. Okay. Um, we're on the hour, so if anyone else um, would like to follow up on these, here's different ways to connecting. If y'all know anyone else that's doing CI that would be interesting for the community, uh, this CI working group in my mind is about anything that helps with um, the infrastructure that we're doing for uh, Kubernetes and anything within Kubernetes and CNCF community. So please invite them to join. Again, this is uh, monthly. We're not going to have December because it's on uh, the 25th, Christmas. So the next one will actually be in January. So you have a time if you want to prepare something or get someone involved. There's a mailing list. And on Cloud Native, join the CNCF CI Slack. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.